Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a minute as a couple of housekeeping items. If you could please reach down now and silence your cell phones. I know we sell that, say this at all of the meetings, but I recognized yesterday in one of our meetings after we asked that, some a few people's cell phones did go off. We're looking forward to a very engaging presentation, and we don't want people to be disrupted by those sounds. So please do check and verify that your cell phone is on silent before we get started. And also we were asked to point out the emergency exits as if you're on an airplane. Take note of those. We're hoping there will be no emergencies, but if there is one, you know where to go. Um, we're so pleased that you're joining us this, nor this morning. My name is Angela Shoup, and I'm with the American Academy of Audiology Foundation, and we welcome you to the 10th anniversary Marion Downs Lecture in Pediatric Audiology. This lecture is made possible by the generous philanthropic support of the Oticon Foundation. And Don Shum with Oticon is with us. Would you like to stand for us? And if there are any other Oticon people in the room? Thank you so much. I also wanted to point out that this support makes it possible to offer this presentation not only here at Audiology Now 2014, but also globally via live webinar. And it will also be available as an on-demand webinar if you'd like to watch it again until March of 2015. The Marion Downs Lecture in Pediatric Audiology was established by the AAA Foundation as a tribute to Dr. Downs' dedicated service to the profession in science of audiology on Dr. Downs' 90th birthday. So you all know, as I'm sure, based on the information presented at the General Assembly, on the gala that was held at the Marion Downs Center, and a lot of the publicity that has happened this year, that we are now celebrating the 10th anniversary of the lectureship, and with this, wishing Dr. Downs a very happy 100th birthday. <laughs> Dr. Downs has been referred to as the mother of pediatric audiology. She has had direct and indirect impact on infants and their families through her clinical care, educational activities and scholarly pursuits, advocacy, mentorship of other professionals, and her inspirational, indomitable spirit. This lectureship in her honor continues to spread her influence in advancing excellence in hearing health care to infants and children. We are honored today to have Dr. Nina Kraus join us. Dr. Kraus is the Hugh Knowles Professor in Communication Sciences, Neurobiology and Physiology and Otolaryngology at Northwestern University. She is also the Director of the Auditory Neurosci Neuroscience Laboratory. She'll be presenting a talk today about Biological Assessment and Audiology Spotlight on Central Auditory Processing, Hearing and Noise. Her, Dr. Krauss and her team investigate these issues in multiple populations, including the normal listeners throughout the lifespan, poor readers, individuals with autism, individuals with hearing loss, and also expert listeners, such as musicians and bilingual speakers. She also investigates these issues in animal models. The AAA Foundation is honored to offer this presentation by such an esteemed researcher and international speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nina Krauss. Still not on. Now something is happening, and the sound is not beautiful yet, but these guys are working on the sliders, and it's going to be a sound that you can listen to very happily, I hope, for the next hour and a half. Uh, so is the sound quality about as... Does it sound okay? Yeah? All right. So thank you so much for the opportunity to honor Marion Downs, for the opportunity to, to speak with you, and to really do what it is that is important to me, which is to, to get the knowledge that we uh, are working to understand and put together and discover in the laboratory uh, into uh, the, the world where it can be used. So um, the theme is going to be that experience with sound impacts auditory function. I'm going to bring this theme up in the beginning and at the end and all the way throughout. Uh, first, I'll talk about uh, the biological assessment of auditory processing. 
and some nuts and bolts here about uh, CABR, FFR, and neural synchrony. Neural synchrony, which is a very fundamental principle of auditory processing. Looking here at Chuck Berlin. Um, <laughs> Then I will move to uh, the biological assessment and treatment of aging and hearing loss with a spotlight on hearing and noise and on training. So computer-based and also lifelong music training. Moving on to central auditory processing in children. Again, spotlight on hearing and noise. Language skills, which are so comorbid with auditory processing disorders. Uh, thinking about early biomarkers. And in terms of training, I'm going to, the spotlight there is going to be on FM listening devices. Um, and finally, end with um, what do we know about the impact of early experience biologically? The impact of early experience not only for the developing child, but the impact of early experience now as we're older uh, throughout our lives. So again, um, we have a lot of information from hearing aids, cochlear implants, auditory processing, and the impact of early experience on the adult brain. Um, and finally, this idea that experience with sound impacts auditory function should be a pervasive idea. Set? Okay. So, Marion Downs. Uh, she was uh, such a pioneer of uh, newborn screening and the early fitting of hearing aids and of healthy aging. Uh, and I think she, I, I hope she's listening to this lecture, and I hope she is saying yes, impact of experience is exactly what I have been talking about all my life and I have been living through my own life. Um, and the time, of course, has come uh, to look at hearing more broadly beyond threshold and to recognize that the ears are part of a very rich sensory, cognitive, and reward, how we feel about sound, system. And the way I envision newborn screening in the future is that there is going to be a supra-threshold measure of auditory cognitive health of the kind that I'm going to talk to you about today. And uh, here we go. So hearing is this integrated system. Of course, sound has to come into our ears and into our brains. And importantly, we have to consider the enormous impact of the corticofugal efferent network that we have and that has become evolutionarily more and more important uh, as animals become evolved. And the fact that how we think about sound, so our cognitive function, our memory, and our attention to sound influences auditory processing. Um, how we feel about sound, positively or negatively, our limbic system also impacts auditory processing. We've got uh, information from, uh, this is from Pizzoni's lab, looking at kids with cochlear implants and looking at the impact of auditory experience on cognitive skills. So it might not be surprising that a child with a cochlear implant might perform poorly compared to a normal hearing child on an auditory measure of, me of memory. Turns out, though, that these children also perform poorly on a visual task of memory. So really, the idea here is that auditory-based language development is part and parcel of the development of executive function, and that there is this feedback loop that connects how we think about sound, how we use sound, our cognitive sensory processes. Um, the work of Frank Lynn, I mean, how, how, how direct is that? So here he is telling us that your incidence of getting dementia as we get older and as we lose our hearing is greater if you have a hearing loss. So, you know, you can't be cavalier about, oh, I'm just not hearing as well, I'm not getting the sounds, perceiving them into my brain. When you're losing your hearing, you're losing your ability to think. And so, uh, very important work of his. And, and again, uh, you know, Pizzoni has this auditory scaffolding hypothesis that I've, I've paraphrased. Um, and the idea is that active experience with sound creates a scaffolding for cognitive abilities. So, I mean, we all know that you can take the same sound, feed it through the same device, and every single one of you know that you can get a different outcome. Why is that? The variable, of course, is the brain. 
You can take two people with identical audiograms. One person is excellent at hearing a noise, the other person is horrible at hearing a noise. Why is that? And I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of, of how we can actually look at this and assess this in human beings. Um, a little personal history. So uh, I started out uh, recording, sticking needles in, in bunny rabbit brains and uh, recording from single cells in the auditory cortex while animals learn to do a task that was associated with sound. And so once the animal learned that the sound had meaning, the cell, so this is auditory processing at its very purest. You're recording from an auditory responsive cell and you're watching that cell change its response to the same sound based on its experience. So I still have an animal model and it informs our human work, um, but I am most interested in what can we as people use, and so how can we assess auditory processing in humans? Auditory brainstem responses have been used in the mainstream of audiology for decades now. And uh, FFRs were, were, were discovered at about the same time. And I'm going to be using FFR and CABR interchangeably. I prefer CABR because FFR technically is the following of a frequency as it moves in time, and CABR is the auditory brainstem response to complex sounds, which also include transients and things that don't move in frequency. And so I think it's, 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 it's a more accurate term, CABR. Um, and we pr first published work on this in, uh, in 2001. And this is indisputably, I mean, we all talk about, you know, what is auditory processing? This is indisputably a measure of auditory processing. Um, so what are some features that are important for clinical application? Um, so, you know, we're recording biological responses to sound. Of course, uh, electricity is the currency of the nervous system and, and we have access to that. Uh, but we want to be able to capture the details in sounds. I mean, why sounds are so wonderful because they're so rich. They carry information about pitch and timing and timbre. And if, if, if you look at this, this sound wave here, uh, it contains all this information. And here is the brain wave, the CABR, response to that sound. So it physically resembles the stimulus. What other physiologic response do we have that actually physically looks at and captures the acoustic elements, the many acoustic elements of sound. There is not another one. Um, and you can, in fact, take the, the brain wave that you record, play it back through a speaker, and it'll sound like the sound wave. So here is the sound wave. And here's the brain wave. OK? Um, you will hear a scale, and then the brain stems response, the CABR response to that scale. Mozart. Ah, <laughs> uh, the brain. And my favorite. Okay, so we, we have a lot to work with here. Um, importantly, the response is experience dependent. That's so important. It's reliable in individual people. As clinicians, we need metrics that are usable in individual people. And there is really good test-retest reliability. OK, so it's experience-dependent on multiple time scales, so lifelong and online. And obviously, I mean, just think about this for a millisecond, the things that we spend a lot of time doing, so the languages we speak, if we make music throughout our lives, that's going to have a profound impact on our nervous system and on how our, sound, our brain processes sounds automatically. The things that, I mean, we have a, a system which is adaptable online, but those biological changes are going to be relatively much smaller. They're there, we can capture them, but they're tiny. Um, so CABR is uh, it's essentially a midbrain response. Let's talk about the auditory midbrain. It is one of the most metabolically active areas of the brain. It is a hub of influences from the periphery and from 
um, the, the, the cortical fugal central nervous system. And, you know, ever since, it, certainly in hearing, the, once we had autoacoustic emissions, we realized how important the efferent system was, is. And in neuroscience in general, there has been this enormous paradigm shift of how the brain, how the way in which sound is utilized feeds back and actually affects the very basic processing of sound. So you have a metric here in the CABR of what I'm calling the distributed but integrated auditory system. So it's distributed because you all know all the different parts that make up the auditory pathway and it is also very much of an integrated system. And it is a window into the biology of auditory processing and auditory learning in humans. So um, we have this ingrained terminology about uh, potentials that are early potentials and late potentials. And we talk about things like top-down and bottom-up processing. This terminology is, is, is useful and, and it grounds us. But in fact, it can be limiting and misleading. And there are many ways in which CABR is neither early nor late neither bottom up nor top down. The statement already in the brainstem does not make sense. This distinction between low level auditory and high level cognitive, I mean, the, the, the nervous, the brain doesn't respect disciplines. <laughs> um, it's affected by many factors apart from the brainstem. And I thought, I mean, analogies help me so much. So I thought I would use an, uh, a bike analogy. And I, I, those of you who know me know I, I like bicycles. Um, so, so let's see if this will work for you. You got a bicycle. And my bike has this thingy, this gizmo, that measures how fast I go. So there's a sensor on the wheel that measures how fast the wheel is spinning. But how fast the wheel is spinning is affected by many things. How hard am I pedaling? Who's pedaling? <laughs> My bike's mechanic. The terrain. The weather. The bike that I'm riding in the first place. So this response, this measured speed that's coming from a sensor on the wheel, what it is measuring is affected by many factors in addition to the speed of the, of the wheel itself. And so if you think about it this way, you think about these um, responses, like a CABR is from the brainstem, but not of the brainstem. So you are really looking at a, um, a response, which is a window into many, many contributing influences. And this is useful in humans. Um, incidentally, my little gizmo measures a number of other things. So it measures not only how fast I'm going, what my cadence is, the distance I've traveled. And similarly, with CABR, there is a lot more to brainstem activity than just onset latency. We can measure what, how well is the fundamental frequency being represented? How well are the harmonics being represented? What about the envelope? of the sound? What about the fine structure? Um, how consistent, how synchronous is the response from trial to trial? And so we can take all of this information then and have this concept of neural signatures of how are these different elements of sound and how they are auditorily processed by the brain? How do they impact the things in communication that we care about? So what happens as we get older? What is the biological auditory processing impact of hearing loss? What happens with auditory processing disorders, especially auditory processing disorders that are characterized by difficulty hearing and noise or difficulty with language? And you cannot look at these dimensions here as a volume knob because we know that if you have a hearing loss, it's not that all of these aspects of sound are just simply turned down. Really, a much more meaningful analogy is as my buddy over here with his sliders and his mixing board um, is, 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 is the mixing board because a, a neural signature is going to be very, very specific. You'll see that each one of these things has its own neural signature vis-a-vis -vis auditory processing. So CABR then is a snapshot of auditory processing. 
If you want to know more about it, please visit uh, my website. I'm going to put a stack of cards up there uh, and go to technologies. Um, now, CABR depends on synchrony. It depends on neural synchrony. And uh, we have learned a lot from a disorder, an auditory disorder called auditory neuropathy, uh, about neural synchrony and why it's important and why it isn't important. So a synchronous response from the brainstem um, can occur and is often used as, a, as an index, an indirect index of threshold, but we know that you can have normal thresholds and an absent brainstem response. So um, this was first described by Halliwell Davis in 1979. Um, and then, uh, uh, well, Chuck Berlin and I did some work on, on this and, and a number of other people, but in terms of the incidence, we know that, uh, you know, more than 10% of kids or people who have an absent uh, brainstem response actually have decent thresholds. Uh, so, so we learned something also from um, a case study that we did um, where we really looked at this was a, a young woman who had entirely normal hearing thresholds, she had normal autoacoustic emissions, um, and she functioned really well in quiet. You could talk with her um, and have a conversation in quiet and it was fine. In noise, she, it, was, it was a disaster. And in fact, so this really taught us something. It taught us that neural synchrony may not be critical in quiet, but it is absolutely essential absolutely essential in noise. And so with this person, I mean, you know, we learn so much from an individual case shows us what's possible. And so here is this person who I'm having a perfectly good conversation with in quiet. Now I'm in a car. She's deaf. Anytime there is background noise, she says, I am deaf. Um, and so the auditory system is the temporal expert in the brain. So if we're going to be looking at synchrony and its importance in communication, we should look at the auditory system. Um, and a way of looking at temporal precision is to look at trial by trial neural synchrony. So here I can be presenting responses, uh, I can be presenting stimuli and you can look at the response to the same sound again and again. And you can see this individual has a very synchronous response on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. Every trial is pretty much eliciting the same response from the brain. Have this other person, and what you can see is a very jittered response. And you can quantify this and have a measure of neural synchrony. Um, we wondered, is this due to degradation over time, or if somebody is just asynchronous in their response to sound, are they just asynchronous from the beginning? And in our hands, it, it really is trial by trial variability. If you are asynchronous, the very second time you're going to be presented with a sound, it's going to be slightly different from the way your brain responded it to the first time. And again, I will put it to you, it's because people have not made, formed, sound to meaning coupling that enables the nervous system to respond automatically in a predictable fashion. So um, one of the ways that we have, have looked at this is uh, through the lens of, of, of a language disorder of reading. And we see that there is a very, very orderly and systematic relationship with how synchronously the auditory system responds to sound and a person's reading ability. So we had uh, almost 100 kids. And especially the neural synchrony in response to the consonant portion of the sound related to how good a reader they were. Uh, this relationship with reading is something that uh, Mike Kilgard did very beautifully in an animal model. Um, there is a, a rat analog to the human dyslexia gene, and he recorded, these are single neurons in auditory cortex, to words, and he found that in the mutant model, you have a very asynchronous response to sound, which is different from the normal model, which is in fact showing a very nice synchronous response to sound. Um, we have looked, at, and I, I invite you please to take a look at this paper um, where we looked at um, about 800 people across the lifespan, and there is a neural synchrony profile, and you can really uh, put your patient there and see to what extent 
is the neural synchrony that you are seeing um, exceeding or is it less than what you would expect from an individual of that age? Um, also, you can see that the standard deviations get bigger as we get older. Uh, there's a lot of variability in older adult performance. And again, you can have a way of, of looking at this. Um, I can also tell you that neural synchrony is something that is affected by experience. And so this is very important. So here, you know, we have this neural synchrony, which may be a bottleneck to auditory processing. And it is also something that is quite malleable to um, experience. And I will show you examples of this. Uh, know that there are also, remember I mentioned a number of CABR ingredients, and they all have their own distinct developmental time courses. Okay, so we can think of a neural synchrony then as a, as, as a uh, continuum and uh, auditory processing disorders as a breakdown in neural synchrony when we think about aging and hearing loss and auditory processing disorders. We can also think about ways of training to improve neural synchrony in older adults, people with hearing loss and auditory processing disorders, okay? So let's just keep remembering neural synchrony. As I move to the very first um, uh, part of, 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 of uh, aging and hearing loss, which is going to consider biological assessment and treatment. So this is, in terms of clinical populations, I'm going to talk about aging for a little while, and then I'm going to talk about kids. Okay, that's number three. So here's number two. And this is a great time to talk about Marion Downs. And if you haven't read this book, Shut Up and Live, it is so worth your while. It is a beautiful read, and, and it is just... Um, her, 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 her personality, um, her straightforward personality, it was, was just something that, that was so um, moving to me as, as I went through every single page of, of, of that book. So uh, very, very strong testament to, uh, to healthy living and healthy aging. Um, so as we get older, we have difficulty, of course, hearing a noise with auditory memory and speed of processing. Uh, you are not strangers to these ideas. Um, we know biologically one of the things that happens, probably the, the most profound and straightforward thing that happens biologically, is that our neurons simply slow down. There is a neural slowing. Um, and this, we have a decreased inhibitory processes. Uh, Don Kaspari has done a ton of work in this area, especially with brainstem inhibition. Um, there's broader neural tuning, longer neural recovery, increased neural noise decreased brain connectivity, all these things um, that will conspire. So here you know, is, is a young adult's response to a speech sound, and here is an older adult's response to a speech sound, and um, they're different. So, so what's going on here? Again, this is not a volume knob effect. There are very specific aspects of auditory processing that slow down. So here is the responses to, to consonants. Consonants are what are vulnerable to disruption, and they uh, have acoustic elements that rely on this, this beautiful auditory system of yours to respond synchronously. So this is in blue, the uh, young person, and in black, an older person. And what you can see is selectively the response to the consonant is later. So the consonant is delayed here in an older person. Um, also, I talked about neural synchrony. Well, neural synchrony does get worse as we get older. And you can see neural synchrony here in terms of phase locking. It gets worse. Also, the representation of the harmonics, generally not the fundamental frequency, but of the harmonics, gets lower in, uh, as, as we age. So these are some things that happen. Um, what do we do about it? So again, if we go to our animal models, we can see that, um, this is from Mike Merzenich's lab, that you can train animals. Well, first of all, you can see this is an example of an older animal's response to sound. The red dots are sounds, and you can see that there's a, quite a bit of jitter in the older animal's response to sound. And after the animal has been trained to know what to pay attention to vis-a-vis -vis these sounds, you see that the synchrony, these, are, these little black dots are responses of single neurons. The neural, the, the neural synchrony of those individual neurons now line up with the stimulus better after training. And the animals can learn. And really, I mean, we know very, very clearly that the nervous system is capable of changing until we die and we can learn new things. Um, 
So what about humans? We, uh, the work from uh, Adam Ghazali's lab has been really cool, and, uh, and Daphne De uh, Bevalier um, and Barry have done some very nice work with uh, uh, high-speed high high um, video games, um, these action video games that are, um, really seem to have an, an impact on multitasking ability, which is something that uh, gets rough as we, as we get older, um, and, and memory. So, you know, there, there is a, a whole precedent for some auditory training. Uh, but we're interested here in, um, in, in hearing a noise, right? I mean, we really, we, we're interested in communication abilities and we really want to know about hearing a noise. So, you know, what, what do we have out there? What, 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 what products are, are available for, for uh, training hearing a noise? There is this lace. Uh, which is a computer-based program that uh, trains people to hear degraded speech. Um, there's also a cognitive component as well as sort of a counseling component where people are given tips, like uh, if you're in a noisy environment, make sure you're facing the person that you're talking to, things like that. Um, so we, we dabbled with this, this program um, it, with young adults and found, in fact, that we could train young adults to improve <laughs> in their hearing and noise ability, and also that six months later um, that improvement was maintained. And we also saw that there was a biological improvement in um, sound processing, and that in, in particular, and this will come, uh, become clearer later, it was the, the strength of the fundamental frequency that became enhanced, and the neural enhancement uh, went hand in hand with how well the individuals improved in terms of their hearing and noise. So you had this, this biological and behavioral measure. But we really want to know about older adults. So this, the focus here is on older adults, and Suido and, and um, colleagues have, have looked at uh, how do individuals do on the various LACE measures, and they do improve. Uh, and they also found that there were improvements in measures that were not tested, so these were transfer measures, other measures of hearing and noise and cognitive function. So um, there is some evidence that you could improve um, hearing and noise <clears throat> in older adults. But um, when we did our older adult studies, we looked at a different program. We looked at um, the brain fitness program that is delivered uh, by Posit Science, and Mike Merzenich has had uh, something to do with, with the development of, of, of that program. Um, and it's based on two principles. One, it is based on the adaptive contraction and um, magnification of constant vowel transitions of these sounds that are tricky. And at the same time, <coughs> sorry, there is this um, adaptive increase in memory demands. So you have these sounds that are changing in an adaptive way to help you understand elements of sounds that are meaningful, while at the same time you are first starting with just simple sounds that are then put into words and that, that are then put into phrases and then sentences, and you have longer and longer and more complicated attentional and memory demands. And Samira Anderson, um, who earned her doctorate in, in my lab, um, was really spearheading this. And she's currently at the uh, University of Maryland as an assistant professor. Um, so what we did is we uh, looked at a bunch of older adults. and. Uh, uh, Samira was an audiologist for 25 years before becoming a neuroscientist, and it was wonderful. I mean, this is just a great example of, you know, the, the, the participants came in. They, they wanted knowledge about their hearing, and she could give it to them. And, you know, when, when the studies were over, they were, they were in tears. Do you have another study? Um, and uh, anyway, but we tested these older adults. They came uh, into Northwestern, and we um, did some testing. And we had two groups. So we randomly assigned people to the brain fitness group. Um, and this was um, for eight weeks. And the uh, active control, they watched educational videos for the same amount of time. And they also spent the same amount of time uh, interacting because they had to answer questions about those videos. So they weren't doing this auditory cognitive training, um, but they were doing something. Uh, and then we brought them back. And so these are the things that we looked at. We looked at the biological responses to sound, cortical, subcortical, speech and noise measures, and cognitive tests. 
What did we find? Well, the active control, this is timing, active control did not change. It was stable uh, two months later from beginning to end. But what we found is that the people who went through the brain fitness program, their timing, their neural response timing in response to consonants, the consonants of sound, um, got faster. So that happened. And we also found that there was an improvement in their hearing and noise ability, their auditory memory abilities, and their speed of processing. And that the effects were greatest for people who had hearing loss. Um, let's talk for a minute about hearing loss. Because what happens with hearing loss, as we know from an acoustic standpoint, is that there, is, there becomes an, an imbalance between the envelopes in sound and the fine structure. And uh, not to get too technical about it, the envelope of sound sounds like your voice when your mouth is full of and it's office. And that basically gives you the envelope information and sound, whereas uh, Henry Higgins over here exemplifies the fine structure and the information that is necessary to distinguish one sound from another. And uh, so with CABR, we can disentangle the envelope and the fine structure. Um, and we know in young adults that there is a good balance between envelope and fine structure. We know that with aging, everything just gets diminished. With hearing loss, what happens is that there really becomes an imbalance between the temporal fine structure and the envelope encoding. It's because of this loss of inhibi in inhibition that the envelope now swamps out the fine structure, which is why older adults with hearing loss tell you, don't yell at me, I can hear you, I can't understand you. Um, and with training, with the uh, computer-based training that we did, we found that the training partially restored the normal balance between the envelope and the temporal fine structure, and that the changes tracked with actual improvements in hearing and noise, so the biology and the behavior tracked. And, and all of this is published, so uh, please go to our website, download the publications, check out the nitty-gritty. Um, one little detour about uh, hearing aids and CABR. This is all I'm going to say about it. I think this is a huge new horizon. Um, and, and here's a, just a proof of concept. You know, you can measure the response by the brain when you're wearing a hearing aid. And the best is to really do it in sound field. Um, and you can compare hearing aid settings or different kinds of hearing aids. And what you can see here is in this first setting, and this is a real person, um, you know, she came in and she said, these hearing aids aren't working for me anymore. And so we gave her another set of hearing aids and she went around with them for a couple days and, uh, and then she came back and, uh, and she said, you know, I can't remember the last time I heard so well in a restaurant. So she, she was clearly happy with the hearing aids and we had an objective measure of auditory processing. of sound, she was now uh, processing more effectively. Okay, so we have aging and hearing loss, and we know that uh, aging, well, first of all, aging reduces all kinds of processing of these different elements of sound. And with computer-based training, you can help improve at least the timing of consonants. Hearing loss results in this imbalance between fine structure and envelope. And again, with training, you can partially restore this balance. What about things that we do for a long time? So I'm going to get to something um, when I talk about auditory processing in, in kids and, 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 and different intervention strategies. I mean, short-term training is what it is. It's short-term. And it takes the nervous system doing things a lot in order for the nervous system to change. So what about, and this is Gus Mueller, by the way. Um, so, so um, what about, if, if, if you just consistently play a musical instrument throughout your life, you know, no more than uh, twice a week for 20 minutes, you'll qualify as, as, as a lifelong musician. So what is the impact of that on aging? Well, I showed you that if your typical older adult just has delayed timing in response to, to, to format transitions, right, to consonants, where do you think Gus Mueller's 
um, response is going to be in terms of his timing. Okay, so you, an older adult musician is going to have much better neural timing in response to the consonant. Um, talked about uh, neural synchrony, and that's something that gets worse as we get older. If you're an older adult musician, you have very consistent responses to sound. Phase locking. Worse as you get older. If you're an older adult musician, you have better phase locking. That's why you're so cool, Chuck. Uh. <laughs> um, the, the, the harmonics are decreased as we get older, but if you are an older musician, you have great representation of the harmonics. Um, so, you know, compare, see for yourselves, draw your own conclusions. Um, this is a response of a young adult, an older adult, and an older adult with musical training. A biologically younger brain. Uh, there is a, a, a signature of just across the lifespan, people with musical experience hear better in noise, they have better auditory working memory, which is absolutely important to carrying on a conversation. You have to remember what I just said a few seconds ago to know what I'm telling you right now. Um, and this musician signature is largely intact with hearing loss. All right. So music then um, really enables us to process, it improves our auditory processing in a number of spheres that we can measure and we can look at objectively and biologically. So we have so much to work with in terms of measuring and assessing and understanding and figuring out and applying auditory processing. Okay, so um, auditory processing disorders. So auditory processing disorders affect about a percent of the population and these are people uh, typically kids, but uh, who, why, why should this go away? Um, with normal audiograms and the difficulties that have been summarized, so the difficulties in life is that uh, people with auditory processing disorders have difficulty processing rapid and degraded speech. They have inordinate difficulty hearing a noise. Uh, there is an enormous comorbidity of language disorders, reading impairments, specific language impairment, and inattention, inattention distractibility. They don't know what to pay attention to. They don't know what to pay attention to. Uh, and I want to talk about the biological assessment, um, especially of auditory processing and, uh, you know, with this focus here on hearing and noise and language abilities and what, what we can start to now put together and what will be meaningful to us. Okay, so hearing, speech, and noise, again, is dependent on our ability to hear consonants, which are acoustically very, very vulnerable in noise. And consonants, as I showed you before, consonants are encoded by the nervous system through timing, through neural, precise neural timing. Another way of looking at timing, another side of the timing coin, is phase. And so you can measure a person's response to ga, and a person's response to ba, and then just compute, do what we call a cross phasogram, but just compute the timing difference between the response to ga and ba, and if there is good timing difference between your processing of these two sounds, you will see more red. That's easy to interpret. Um, and of course, for the ah portion, where these sounds, there is no timing difference, there is no timing difference, so no red. And you can see that people who are poor at hearing a noise, in fact, do not distinguish sounds very well in terms of neural timing. There's a nice and orderly systematic relationship, look at this, look at this, um, between speech and noise ability and the timing measured in, 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 in phase shift, okay? Um, another ingredient, so in noise, what happens is that it's hard to hear these consonants, right? Because they are so quiet and they are so quick and they're so acoustically complex. So we rely a lot on the fundamental frequency to carry us and the fundamental frequency is important for, there's a, there's a, there's a pitch associated with each one of your voices. Fundamental frequency is a big component of that and uh, it helps us identify auditory objects. It turns out that strength of fundamental frequency tracks with hearing and noise pretty well, okay? 
So that is, these are two very important ingredients. And if you now look at, this is the audiograms that I showed you at the beginning of my talk, one dude has good hearing and noise, the other one doesn't, and they have very similar audiograms, and look at the difference in the representation of their fundamental frequency. The guy who has good representation of their fundamental frequency has good representation of that fundamental frequency in quiet and in noise. The noise has not disrupted the relation, the, 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 the processing of that acoustic element, whereas this poor guy, he was doing all right in quiet, but the minute you threw in the noise, no strength of the fundamental frequency. You can measure that objectively. Um, also, hearing a noise is mediated by cognitive load. And I can tell you that if you look at the strength of the fundamental frequency and its relationship to standardized measures of hearing a noise, the more cognitive load there is, the better the relationship is, which is, again, why this measure, the CABR, really is a measure of cognitive and sensory integration. So hearing a noise, fundamental frequency, and the neural distinction of consonants. These are two very important acoustic ingredients. Um, let's move to language skills. So uh, language skills, turns out, auditory processing in most situations, in people who have normal hearing, normal processing is really important. And there have been many, many, many studies showing that auditory processing skills coincide with language skills. And we also know that auditory processing disorders are very much associated with difficulties with language, with language so dyslexia and specific language impairment. So uh, an aspect of, of auditory processing is phonological processing, the ability to categorize, mentally manipulate, and rhyme sounds, so you, you know, phonemes. And, it's, and we're not talking about discriminating them, we're talking about really understanding them as categories of sounds. Um, and typical readers are very good at distinguishing the categories of like da and ta, and a poor reader is just not especially good at doing that. Well, when we look at auditory processing biologically in good and poor readers, we see that poor readers have delayed neural timing, and we find that they have a reduction in their representation of the harmonics in sound. Well, the harmonics are, would carry a ton of information distinguishing one speech sound from another speech sound. And again, this is where there's an overlap. So, you know, it's very nice. You can really begin to, d to disambiguate and disentangle. So there are some overlaps between hearing a noise and uh, phonological processing, and then there are also real distinctions. Here's where the overlap is. The overlap is in the processing of consonants. So, you know, again, it turns out that good readers are really good at distinguishing differences between consonants in, you know, based on their timing and compared to poor readers. Um, we're very interested in, as I, I think very much in the, in the spirit of, of, of Marion Downs, is, is in devising early biomarkers of auditory processing and early identification of, of kids who are going to go and have auditory processing and language uh, difficulties. And so we have a project that we call Biotots. Uh, we're longitudinally, I don't know what, I don't know what possesses me to do longitudinal studies, which we do, uh, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm inherently so impatient, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and these longitudinal studies are, are punishing, but I, I, since individuals are, are, are individuals, it is scientifically, you know, it's just the science, the science makes, the science made me do it. Um, <laughs> It, it, you, you just get a lot of information if you follow individuals over time. And so we're following these three-year-olds, which are fun to test, um, and, and, and following them until they are you know, five and six and learn to read and, and really uh, tracking their language skills. Um, and we have a whole bunch of work that has to do with rhythm and auditory motor processing that I'm not going to get to even touch on today, but it's cool and fun. And we have these kids banging on drums. Uh, but back to auditory processing, uh, what we find is that these three-year-olds, the three-year-olds who have the more developed 
auditory processing skills are the ones who have more synchronous responses to sound, just in that measure of neural synchrony that I, I showed you before. And if we look at our phasogram, again, the kids who have good language development at, th at, three, years, at three years of age, you, know, you can see this. And you might be able to see this in a newborn. And, and we do re record re these responses in newborns. And we haven't done a systematic study. Um, actually, Samira is working on that. So, so here we go. Um, so if we look at language impairment, we can see that these specific aspects, the representation of the harmonics, onset timing, representation of um, consonants, and response consistency, as well as envelope, which I can't get to right now, um, are very important acoustic ingredients that undergird language development and language use. Let's talk a little bit about training. So, so say you have somebody who has an inconsistent response to sound. Say you have somebody who is manifesting, is coming to the clinic and is saying, I have difficulty following, um, you know, or my kid won't, 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 be, won't follow my, my auditory instructions, especially when it's noisy. Uh, and you've assessed them biologically and you see that there is a, a problem. You know, what, what do you do about it? And there have been a number of studies um, I've kind of listed them here, um, and, and you know, the, the effects of training uh, have, have been mixed, both behaviorally, and I've um, uh, outlined here, the, these are the, the physiologic studies. Um, but one of the things that we really do have to keep in mind is, you know, well, you know, what is your outcome measure, and the fact that any auditory training program is short. And what we need to be really thinking about in terms of auditory training is the kinds of auditory training that will teach people um, information that they, how, how to process sound in a way that they will carry it over into their lives or they will be taught in such a way that they are getting a lot of experience with processing sound in a more efficient way. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the work that we've done with FM listening devices and what really characterizes this study, and we ha really got some pretty neat results, but what characterized the study is the fact that these kids wore the devices in the classroom for a whole year. Six hours a day, all of their teaching was done with this FM device. And so, you know, an FM device, the teacher's wearing this, the transponder, and the kids are wearing this cute little earring. And as we went into this, we knew that others had found um, an increase in attentiveness and in listening skills wearing these devices. There had been reports of improvements in literacy and in academic achievement. And so what we did is we, again, randomly assigned kids to wear this device. And uh, we were drawing from the Hyde Park Day School, which as opposed to these other studies that we do with uh, in gang reduction zones, very is um, both in Chicago and in LA. <clears throat> in Chicago, the Hyde Park Day Schools are, um, these are very privileged kids and families and they have every resource. Uh, these kids are very smart um, and they have language problems. They are dyslexic primarily and they go to the Hyde Park Day School for a year or two and then they are uh, spit back out into the mainstream. Um, <clears throat> we had another group of kids educated in the same classroom who did not wear the device. And Jane Hornicle is the person in my lab who spearheaded that work. Um, what we found was that the kids who wore the device, I mean, most importantly, these were the kids who improved the most on reading measures. And, uh, you know, and we had matched them in pretest. So, uh, and, and the kids who did not wear the device did improve, but not as, not, not as much. Um, remember this measure of response consistency. So we know that there's this neural synchrony really aligns itself with language ability and specifically with reading skills, which we were interested in here. And what we saw is that the FM users got more consistent in terms of their neural response to sound. The controls didn't. And so here is an individual example. Again, individuals are so important. You can see this one individual child. You can see how jittered his response was at the beginning of the academic year, and then after wearing this device for a year, um, he has a very synchronous response to sound. And if you look now at the group data, 
we looked especially at who were the kids who really improved in reading scores and improved significantly greater than eight standard scores. And when we did that, what we found is that the kids who improved, these were the kids who had the worst neural synchrony in the first place, and they improved after training. They are now, we, you know, we, we, we fix them, or the FM device fix them. You know, they, they are now in, in the normal, they are in the normal range in terms of this biological measure of auditory processing. And we can predict, I mean, we could have predicted ahead of time who would be a good candidate for FM training. Um, because it is the guys who had the worst neural response consistency, they were the ones who made the greatest gains in reading. And so neural synchrony, this response consistency, measured in this subtle, subtle way in response to consonants, is a bottleneck, clearly, for some kids in terms of auditory processing. So these FM listening devices provide auditory training for language skills. They're classroom-based. They are used throughout the day. And importantly, they focus attention on meaningful speech. This is important. So what is the mechanism? What is the me why is this working? And I think that it is attention. You have to learn what to pay attention to begin with. My husband's a musician, and I learn, try to you know, learn some songs, and, and he comes up and he says, well, you know, if you listen to that, you'll hear that he's not plucking the string, he's pulling off the string with his left hand. And I'm deaf to that until he comes and tells me, this is what you've got to pay attention to, and then I can pay attention to it. Oh, yeah, I get that. Um, but others have shown that, that cortical responses reflecting attention can be modified with FM use. In, in our study, we saw that with parental and teacher reports, that it was the kids who improved the most in terms of their response consistency. They were also the ones who the parents reported, hey, this kid is paying attention to sound better. Um, in others, this is a study that was done in uh, Helen Neville's lab. Uh, we know that there are cortical responses that index attention. So you record the response to a sound when you're paying attention to it, and re record the response to the same sound when you're not paying attention to it, and you subtract the two responses, and here's your index of attention. Turns out that some kids with specific language impairment don't have this response. Um, in a study that they did uh, using computer-based training, what they found is that after training, this attention response emerged. Um, so, so I, you know, I, th I think attention is important here, um, and it is learning what to pay attention to. I think it plays a big role in the brain's response to sound, because you have to pay attention if you are making a sound to meaning, auditory cognitive, you are making a sound to meaning connection, you have to learn what to pay attention to. And this is an important line. Attention in the past influences automatic sound processing in the present. Okay, so what we have spent a lot of time paying attention to, the sounds in our language, our mommy's voices, automatically our nervous system when we're asleep will respond to the sounds that have been meaningful to us, that we have paid attention to a lot, that we've cared about a lot in the past. We have changed the auditory processing in our nervous system. Um, in, in art, there's this, the myth of the innocent eye, where artists talk about, okay, you've got a sculpture, you've got a piece of art here, and the sculpture is the same thing, but the people who are viewing it are going to view it differently based on what they bring to viewing the piece of art. You know, you have a, a, each person is bringing their own experience with looking at things in their lives and is going to interpret that piece of art differently. So there, there, there is no innocent eye, and there is no innocent ear. Um, so how can we strengthen auditory processing? By making these sounds, which in turn then strengthen the way in which specific ingredients of sounds are automatically processed, and activities that will strengthen auditory processing will engage cognitive sensory and reward systems, and assistive listening devices in the classroom seem to be one of those. Um, music education, I could talk to you, with you for days on, on, on this topic. And, and one of the reasons that I study music is because music is such a great model for auditory learning. It engages sensory cognitive reward system. Um, there are software-based programs. 
Um, and learning another language, learning more languages. Again, this is uh, a way of strengthening our auditory processing. Um, all right, very last uh, spot here is to talk about the biology of early um, influences. And uh, first, just a little bit about cochlear implants and hearing aid and auditory processing, and then this idea of the imprint of early experience on the adult brain. So this is uh, work that Anu Sharma did, and Anu, Anu was my very first doctoral student. Um, and uh, she you know, went on to do this, this really cool work showing that uh, a cortical potential, P1, has a uh, orderly and systematic developmental time course. And if you give a kid a cochlear implant, when he's older than seven years old, his cortical timing is never going to approach the normal range of cortical timing. But if you implant a child uh, between the ages of three and six, about half of the kids actually do manage to uh, have auditory processing responses to sound that are in the normal range. And if you implant really early, uh, almost all of the kids have normal cortical processing of sound. And the same thing holds, you see the same pattern for hearing aid fitting. This is very, very cool, and, and, and yes, this is why Marion uh, thought that it was so important to identify kids early, because the earlier you put a hearing aid on someone, the uh, more likely they are to achieve this normal pattern of, of cortical activity, and um, whether or not you have normal P1 latencies tracks with language development, so how good these kids are actually on their language skills. So um, I'm going to, this is going to be a surprise to some of you, I bet. So if we just, you, you're all familiar with the click uh, response, brainstem response, right? No strangers here. So um, the conventional wisdom is that uh, the, you know, clicks mature, uh, and by the age of two, they're mature, and then they look like uh, the adult uh, latency. This is, you're looking at wave five latency. Well, um, you know, so that, you know, if you sort of draw a line between the two-year-old and the adult, it's kind of a straight line. But, uh, you know, we, we looked at these 800 people, and uh, what we found is that there's actually this overshoot, a very robust overshoot that happens between the ages of two and uh, eight and nine. And um, I think that this overshoot is probably important. Um, you know, maybe kids with auditory processing disorders aren't uh, developing this heightened sensitivity to elements of sound during this developmental phase. Um, we can see the same pattern in the components of uh, CABR. And we can see it in the frequency domain. This is the neural response consistency that I showed you before. What is interesting is that uh, these other ABR ingredients, um, I think it's easier for you to see here, that uh, you, you can have these subcomponents that have distinct developmental trajectories. So the fact is, and, and just take a look at, the, at this paper, we have, we have two of them, um, where you know, we, we can really chart out the development of different components of sound. And, and this, is, this is ongoing work. There's, you know, much more work that needs to be done here to uh, really uh, um, identify the, the other subcomponents that we haven't followed developmentally well enough, like the envelope, for example. But we've already gotten a lot of information on a lot of these, these different responses to sounds developmentally. And they, they really provide a canvas um, for looking at auditory processing, okay? Um, finally, early influences on the adult brain. So, that if you take an animal and you, uh, have them, you subject them to certain auditory experiences, that it's going to actually impact the adult brain. How do we know this? This is work from uh, Merzenich's lab showing that animals that are reared in noise, and this is not loud noise, this is just uh, you know, low level noise, young animals, um, that if just for a short period of their time during development, they are listening to, you know, this is like the noise of your air conditioner. 
um, that as they, they develop into adult animals, they don't develop the normal tonotopic map that is the, the normal tonotopic map. They, they are blunter in their um, representation of sounds because, you know, the developing animal is, and human is, is hungry for information that's going to have meaning and it's going to sculpt, it's going to change its responses to sound based on its experience. Um, this is work that Dan Sains has done in, uh, he has a whole line, beautiful line of work, where he takes juvenile animals, trains them to do auditory tasks, and then compares them as adults to other animals that hadn't had that training. And the adult animals that had had the training earlier in life are able to do auditory and auditory cognitive tasks much better than the ones that hadn't had that early experience. So this early experience, it stopped, still impacts the adult organism. Again, what about humans? So in humans, um, well, how many of you have played a musical instrument sometime in your life? How many of you are still playing? <laughs> so case in point. Um, so, 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 so the fact is, all of you who raised your hands, that music experience has had and has an impact on how you are listening and processing sound today. Um, so we did two experiments, one in young adults and one in older adults. And what we saw is that, uh, so in the young adults, these were Northwestern students that we matched in every way except for um, whether they had had a musical experience in their childhood. So moderate is about five years or so or, or more. Um, and they weren't playing an instrument at the time that we tested them. And they had larger responses to sound. These are this, um, the fundamental frequency. And also they have um, uh, less of a, of, of a noise. So they have a better signal to noise ratio. And the individuals who had the intermediate amount of training sort of fell in between. Now, this is really cool. I showed you this now. This is the third time you've seen this graph. As an older adult, the timing to consonants is delayed, right? What about if you look at older adults, like they're 70 years old now, and ask about their early musical experience? They haven't played for decades. Has that early musical experience had an impact? And the fact is, it has. So people who have had musical experience in their lives for a number of years and then for decades do not actually play music, presumably they have been taught to pay attention to sound and the auditory motor processing and integration, which is important for speaking too, um, these connections have been formed. And so you have an individual who later in life is responding, their, their nervous system automatically is responding to speech better. So in terms of the decisions we make for ourselves and our children in terms of um, their music education in their lives, draw your own conclusions. <laughs> uh, so summary of, of early influences, um, earlier cochlear implantation and hearing aid use impact cortical response timing and development of auditory, of language skills, sorry. Um, and that there are ingredients of auditory processing that we can index by CABR across the lifespan. And this really provides us with a canvas for assessing auditory processing. Um, and early auditory enrichment in humans, in the case of music, impacts the adult brain long after the experience has stopped. So I just want to say a few words, pulling some ideas together. And then I think we'll have some time for questions. Um, so I remember I talked about hearing as being this distributed but integrated system involving cognitive and reward and sensory processes and how we interact with sounds is going to shape how neurons respond to sound. So we can think about the experiences that we have. So when we pay attention to sound in the moment, it engages our cortical fugal system. This is a system that is very, very malleable. It changes all the time. Uh, the, 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 the training effects fade very, very quickly. But you are engaging your cognitive processing in the processing of sound, which strengthens then your 
automatic afferent processing of sound. And it is actually the lower portions of the system that uh, you can see stability with respect to experience and training. They are long-lasting, stable, and automatic responses to sound, which are the consequence of repeated attention to and use of the system. And importantly, we have access to this biology of auditory processing and learning in humans. And you know, if you think of CABR as a uniform measure, well, you know, we've got a problem, right? A problem in assessment and management of hearing is that you're going to use a different metric, different stimuli, different techniques. Say if you're trying to assess hearing and noise in a baby or in an experimental animal or an older person. Well, it would be really useful if you had a uniform metric like this one that you can use across labs, you can use across species. It's been done. You can get it in babies, you can get it in older adults. And uh, you have now a uniform metric. Um, there have been many, many published studies, and, and there's more and more interest in, in using CABR and FFR is just at, at, at uh, ARO, and, and just the amount of work being done in this area is, is I mean, you know, people notice this is a useful measure of auditory processing for all kinds of questions, sound themed, that, that people are interested in. Um, the, the IHS uh, system is the only one that has a dedicated CABR module at the moment. Um, but many systems can, can record this, this res these responses. Um, I've got a, a lot of freeware that is free. And again, if you um, <laughs> check out our, our, our website, uh, we're happy to send you our processing routines and stimuli. And uh, you know, we want people to, to use the information that, that, that we have. Um, so you know, how do we reach the clinic? Um, I will put to you that CABR is a direct measure of auditory processing, and, and I really see it as a, as a gold standard and arguably the most sensitive measure of auditory processing that we have in humans. Um, it captures the acoustics of sound, the wonderful acoustics of pitch, timing, and timbre, phase. Um, and we have these neural signatures, these neural signatures that we can now begin to understand, you know, what happens in terms of the auditory processing of sound? What happens as we get older? What happens when we have a hearing loss? What happens if we have an auditory processing disorder? What happens if we have difficulty hearing and noise? How about training? How does experience and training impact this auditory processing and these signatures? Um, and, and I really do think that this is wide open in terms of uh, hearing aid and cochlear implant device development, um, as well as use in, eventually in terms of, of fitting and monitoring of, of hearing aids. And you have this uniform metric across labs, age, and species. So, you know, really the, the role of the audiologist is, is way, way bigger than historically conceived, I, I think. Um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're dealing with human communication. This is what people care about uh, a lot. And, and hearing is this distributed but integrated network. And it involves not just our little hearing system, auditory pathway, but the fact that it integrates with how we feel about sound, how we think about sound, how we remember it, how we pay attention to it. Um, and auditory biology is not frozen in time. It's a moving target. It's experience dependent. So if, if you remember nothing else, um, I'm going to leave you with two slogans. And I hope you'll remember these slogans. They're, they're easy. The first one is we are what we do. And the second is our past shapes our present. And I think we have biological evidence to back this up. And I, I think Marion Downs, uh, by what she has done and uh, how she has lived, um, is, is, is a testament to these, these two slogans. Um, I want to acknowledge the people in my lab who do all the work that I get to talk to you about and our funding sources. Uh, I have just the best people in, in, in 
working with me that you could possibly have. And they are all going out and, and influencing the field. Um, it's, it's, it's just a real delight. Um, and I invite you, please, to visit our website. Um, and do start something that is unique to our website is that we have these friendly overviews. And what they are are slideshows. And so what we do is, with one picture and one line of text, we'll summarize two years of work. <laughs> and you know, so really, in five minutes, if you're interested in, you know, what do we know about speech and noise? Just go through the slideshow. It'll tell you what our, you know, what, what our, our research is. And if you're just interested in this one little part of it, we'll download that publication and forget about the rest, but you'll get an overview. And, and again, because it is so important to us to communicate our little scientific discoveries to the broad audience of people who is interested in communication, um, these friendly overviews are they're a labor of love. They're a ton of work. We update our website almost daily. Um, so it would please me if you would check it out. Um, and, and I thank you for your attention. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> what? Shlomo, since I'm at the microphone, Shlomo, why didn't you come, come over here and use the mic? You're second, though. I'm first. <laughs> come, come, come. That was wonderful, Nina. Thank you. Uh, um, most undergraduates in music have to take up to four ear training courses, and the ear training courses are all about tones, no language stuff, intervals, you know, all that stuff. Um, can you give us um, your opinion of how good of an ear training as an 80-year-old somebody might have and hearing better in noise that just took those ear training courses in music versus taking a course like LACE or did some training that was more language-based? Yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful question. So, you know, so as an older adult, if you're now making a choice about you know, what you might do to improve your, your uh, communication abilities and keep them strong. You know, you might want to do a computer-based program, you might want to learn a new language, uh, you might want to learn a musical instrument. Um, first of all, different people like different things. So music may not be for everyone. What I can tell you is that across the lifespan, uh, not just the work we've done, but many, many countless other labs have, have shown that musical experience has a very profound effect on auditory processing and communication skills throughout the lifespan, but we don't have an answer to your question, which is if you were to pit, say, a brain fitness program with learning a musical instrument later in life, um, you know, how, how, how would they do? And what are the differences? Uh, because you know, with music, you are l not only uh, disambiguating different sounds, but you have this auditory motor integration that is a very, very key part of, um, of, of learning that transfers to speech. I, my, my, my hypothesis, which is why I have written an NIH grant, which is currently under review, and I hope to be able to do the study. Um, I would love to be able to partner, as I have wonderful community partners um, who are, are teaching older adults either instruments for the very first time, um, they're either initiating or resuming mu musical training, and I would like to uh, do the exact same measures that we have done using the brain fitness program, and, and, and to really compare and contrast, uh, because I, I, again, there are going to be individual differences, but I think that there are also going to be differences in magnitude and quality of these two different kinds of training. So for the moment, this is a very important question, a question that has no answer, and I hope that an answer will be forthcoming. Hi. 
Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much about continuing to enrich us with your knowledge. Um, also, thank you very much for answering all my questions when I send you online. Within, <laughs> within, within one hour, I get your, your answer. A question, uh, two questions. First of all, I want to ask the, a, this synchrony that you are talking about. Is this related to different arrival of the neuron into the, to the cortex? Is this, I'm sorry. In, I mean, the, is it related to what? In the arrival, arrival. Of, of the signal. Mm -hmm. Or this is a different mechanism. I think this is the same we're talking about. Uh -uh. I think that the dyssynchrony really quite created because the different arrival, some of the neurons, they have a very slow arrival with age, okay? And then some of them is still intact and you're creating the synchrony in the arrival to the cortex. So, Could so, be. so, so these are the kinds of questions, um, obviously, that, that you can answer best in an animal model where you are simultaneously recording from multiple sites. But recording from, um, if, if, if you're looking at, at, at a, a global measure of auditory processing, um, the synchrony is going to depend on the, 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 the time of arrival from one neuron sure. to another neuron. Right. And that timing is going to be very much, whew, um, <laughs> very much influenced by, um, by, 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 by what is going on in the nervous system. So for example, as we get older, we have this uh, diminished inhibitory function. And that is going to impede the arrival of uh, neuron activity from point A to point B. Okay, this, the second question really is a very important to me. The mechanism that you are explained in various articles, which I followed one by one. One was is uh, inhibitory hormones that inhibit the jitter that is causing the increase the noise, signal to noise ratio. And that is, but what I was worried about it is when you're talking about the hormone change, that could be changed over time. Special cells, neural cells that really generate these hormones. However, you with other group um, introduce fascinating theory, Habian theory, that is potentiation that is introducing loud sound, and you saw the plasticity at the level of the cochlear nuclei. That is really goes along with all what you are talking about, plasticity and training and increasing the signal to noise ratio. Sure. Um, in fact, the, the, um, the neurotransmitters that you're talking about um, are ones that are going to be influencing the neural processing of sound. But I think that really, in, in terms of experience, I, I, I think that I really want to make sure that this point gets across, is that um, what we pay attention to in the past is going to influence the auditory processing and the synchrony that will be imparted to a stimulus that is useful in the future. I think a, a very good example in humans is the work of Ravi Krishnan, where he found that speakers of tonal languages, uh, they have CABRs that can very, very specifically follow the contours of tones in those languages, presumably because of the sound to meaning connections that were made. You have now evidence of very nice neural synchrony while speakers of tonal languages are sleeping because of these top-down influences, the sound to meaning connections that were made that then created a more synchronous system for the sounds that were meaningful. I think I need to take another question. Yeah. 
So this is a pretty easy question from our online audience. Andrea asked, were the students in the FM study wearing one or two FM receivers during the study? Uh, two. Um, you were, were talking about always using, like, playing an instrument. Have you investigated singing as opposed to playing? And if it's just the playing, is it also the fact that there's that, you know, the coordination of actually playing a piano, playing guitar, whatever yes. instrument that's impacting yeah. it, not just... Okay. So what, you know, what about singing? And also people ask, what about listening? First of all, in terms of the profound effects of the nervous system, the kind that really do affect <coughs> our communication skills of language skills and language abilities, um, just listening to music will not provide th this kind of um, strengthening in auditory processing. I like to say you will not get physically fit watching sports. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> what is important, though, is the auditory motor connection that is part of, of playing an instrument, right? And, um, and, and, and so, and, and honestly, rhythm and motor processes are, uh, you know, rhythm in, in music is so obvious, but there is rhythm in speech that is important for us to anticipate um, one, uh, what a person is saying and the emphasis that we put on meaning, uh, the fact that auditory motor connections are absolutely inherent in our ability to speak. Um, but you ask about uh, vocalists, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a study now where we are looking at drummers and vocalists. And um, you know, what, what I can tell you, and it's really ongoing, so I, I don't have answers yet, um, is that, that some of the ingredients of the musician's signature that we see in terms of um, um, uh, being able to hear signals, um, the backward timing. masking, yeah, and hearing yeah. a noise, and th um, they, 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 they seem to be occurring, um, and, and we've seen this in instrumentalists, irrespective of the instrument you play, but that there is specialization, and again, we've published on this um, showing specialization of the specialized, that if you play the bassoon, your nervous system um, is just much more likely to respond to the intricacies of a bassoon sound than to another instrument. Um, but again, this is you know th th this th this is um, work in progress. This is work in progress, <laughs> and and it's and, you know the other question is dancers. Yeah. I don't have an answer there. And um, does the age that this? I'm, I guess if you're going to try and teach 80 years old, 80 year old people to play an instrument, you. How early does a child of six or eight starting to play an instrument do better than one that's maybe yeah, a teenager? We, well, I mean, we, we, we you know, certainly no. know, yeah. you know we, like, again, across species that uh, uh, learning tasks early are go is going to have a, a different and a more profound impact than learning things later, but we can learn so many things later and often using different strategies. Uh, Knudsen's work in, an in owls has been fabulous. First, you know, they thought that, that the older animals couldn't learn to do various um, auditory visual tasks, but it turned out that if you just broke the task down into smaller ingredients, smaller pieces, that the older animals could learn perfectly well. They learned as well as the younger animals. So um, it, there, there are obviously differences um, age does matter, but I think importantly, um, comment. old, old, old animals and people continue to learn. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your inspiring um, presentation. I wonder what your view is on brain-computer interfaces. That there's now also brain-computer interfaces that only need maybe three or one uh, auditory event to give feedback, so you can give direct feedback and improve then a response and as an example of a system to uh, learn a second language. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the possibilities of such uh, well, systems? I, mean, I think getting any kind of feedback on what you're doing online is really, really important for learning. And this is what we do when we, when we play a musical instrument. You know, you're getting uh, tactile and auditory and motor feedback of what you are doing and you are adjusting what you're doing accordingly and if you're getting some information because of neural activity that you're recording at the same time um, that could very well be useful. 
Okay, thank you. I'm in a large school district in Texas and we recently had our first um, student show up with a report from her physician requesting an FM trial based completely on a dyslexia diagnosis and based on your research. So we have been um, looking into a lot of your research about dyslexia and, and FM systems and um, I was wondering, um, you did a one year trial with the FM systems in the school. Do you think there's a minimum amount of time that the kids need to be using an FM system in order to see the changes that we could document in the yeah. school as far as benefit goes? Right. So really good question about the amount of time that you might need to use the FM system. So I don't know. I can tell you that one year was very effective. One year, six hours a day. And the fact is that, again, once you've learned how to listen, once you've learned what to pay attention to, you don't need the device anymore. So, you know, we tested and retested these people without their devices. So, and, and this neural synchrony was a neural synchrony that changed without the device. So, certainly a year of using this thing taught the nervous system and taught the, the person how to pay attention to sound in a new way, sculpted the nervous system in a way that likely will be reinforced in their daily living. Whether that could have happened with less training, I don't know. Thank you. Hi. Um, so when you talked about the older musicians, um, what I've found is that as you age and with the experience with the musical instrument, especially at an age of 70, you do have a higher risk of hearing loss. Were the, was that within the criteria that they couldn't have hearing loss? Uh, well, we have looked at older adults with and without hearing loss, okay. and, uh, and, and so the, the data are really, really clear. I think the very best comparison is to take an older person with age-appropriate hearing loss from, from presbycusis okay. and match them. They're, one is a musician and one is a non-musician, and you've matched them in every possible way. And what we are able to see is that this musician signature, so neurally, the enhancement of the harmonics, the enhancement of the processing of consonants, um, the uh, it, better response consistency and phase locking, and better ability to hear in noise, better auditory working memory, this is something that we see across the board in people with music training, irrespective of their hearing loss. And then we've now looked at older adults with hearing loss. And what is interesting is that if, so this is kind of an interesting comparison. If you compare an older adult with hearing loss who is a musician to an older adult with no hearing loss who is not a musician, if the hearing loss is a mild to moderate hearing loss, and the musician has that mild to moderate hearing loss, the musician, the experience, trumps the hearing loss. Really? And also, in addition to that, the type of musician, did you have a specific, like is it a classical? Yeah, the work that has been done so far on the effects of musical experience on the nervous system has been done on many different uh, uh, instruments and genres and again it does not seem to matter for the ba very basic if we call it a musician signature both neurally and in terms of communication it doesn't matter what instrument you play or what genre of music you are playing what is important is the sound to meaning connections the integration of sensory cognitive and reward learning that playing any instrument will afford. That said, there will be specialization of the specialized where if you're playing a certain instrument you're going to have some specializations that are not going to be there in, and, 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 and are going to occur uh, depending on the instrument and the genre of, 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 of instruments that you play and also how you learn to play an instrument. This again is a really important question that I hope we can really nail someday is if you learn an instrument as a language sort of Suzuki style versus you learn it later in life as as a five or six or seven year old more like reading um, you know what kind of an impact does the way you learn the instrument have on the nervous system at this point um, you know we and others have looked at uh, musicians uh, or, or hobbyists who have had both kinds of training but that would be a very interesting issue to disentangle Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Um, I'm interested in the example you gave of changing hearing aid fitting, which addressed the problem more? of the, 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 the speech noise. in is, understanding uh, speech in noise. Me. Sorry. What? The example you gave of changing hearing aid fitting, you changed yes. a hearing yeah. aid mm -hmm. and you got a, res a improvement in hearing in noise and you got an improved response on your objective testing. I don't know if it was synchrony or not. But that's, the way you presented that, it sounded like that was an instantaneous improvement. But was that after a training period as well? or Yeah, again, these are studies that, that need to be done. Um, this was really just... Uh, pretty much instantaneously, I mean, after um, several hours of, of, of using the hearing aid, it was really just um, a proof of concept of comparing one hearing aid with another hearing aid, mm. okay, or one setting compare in, of, of a given hearing aid with a different one. This is something that is instantaneous, and, you know, you can, I think, learn quite a bit from that instantaneous information. Obviously, there are going to, on top of that, be all kinds of training effects, which is why it's so important to have audiologists to come back to after you've used the device and you need adjustments. And it would be very nice, I think, as uh, people are developing devices and uh, uh, audiologists are trying best to accommodate the needs of their individual a hearing aid user to be able to have some objective biological information. So you see this as a clinical test of the future? I do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krause, for an outstandingly enlightening lecture. We really appreciate it. I'm afraid... And I'm afraid we've already run over time by quite a bit, so that's why I held up the sign earlier. But if you weren't able to see it, the passcode is 158. And I know we still have other questions, and if Dr. Krause is willing to, she may be able to take those individually. But thank you so much for attending.